you're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. was redeemed, only beauty remained. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, Washes over me. You have made me new. Now life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new. Now life begins with you. Please from my chains I'm a prisoner no more my shame was ransomed he cancelled my debt and he called me his friend when death was arrested and my life began oh your grace so Washes over me. You have made me new. Now life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new. Now life begins with you. Our Savior is laid on. Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had won. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Open Bible Church San Jose. We are so excited that you have joined us again this week. And uh, we are heading into our uh, second part of a series talking about foundations. But before we do so, I'd like for you to check in if you could, please. Grab your cell phones and uh, with the number on the screen, 408-547-4911. If you could just please check in with us. Uh, the reason why we do that is because we're not sure who exactly is joining us online. And just the other day, I just had someone say, oh yeah, we watch you online. And we never even knew that because there's, it, it's very difficult to track unless you check in. So if you've never checked in with us before, if you could just text to that number on your screen, the word connect, and then follow the prompts, put your first name in there, and whatever other information that they're asking, it just helps us to know who is online with us uh, at any given service. If you have connect, if you have type, uh, text into that number before, text your first name and here, we already have your information. Again, it just allows us to know who is with us uh, for this particular service. Um, I want to encourage you to give uh, those of you that have been on, online with us over the past year, many of you have been really faithful in, in giving, and we thank you for that. Uh, if you text the word GIVE to that same number, 408-547-4911, then follow the prompts. Uh, you can either set up a recurring gift, which really helps us out, or you can do a one-time gift, and uh, whatever is your, your preference, whatever is your convenience. Also, um, Many of you have been joining us online, and, and over the course of the year, they've been lifting the restrictions. And currently, right now, the uh, state of California and the CDC are lifting the mask restrictions for those who have been vaccinated, uh, whether it's indoors or outdoors, under certain situations, you, are, you do not have to wear a mask. Outdoor services for us, you know, we worship and uh, sing without a mask on as long as we're social distance, as long as we're, uh, we're, we're not uh, intruding on anybody's personal space. Uh, we, we've just been, really been having some great services uh, outside. Uh, some are still in their cars, and we, we encourage that, we invite that. If you have never been to one of our outdoor services with live worship, live singing, uh, interaction with the uh, with fellow believers, uh, we encourage you to do so, and so we 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 would want you to do so. Um, we're going to be preparing to be gathering indoors sometime in the near future. We will keep you updated on that, and we want to make sure that you are well advised of what uh, the responsibilities and things like that uh, come with that, and we are doing everything we can to comply. And this is one of the reasons why we've been staying outdoors for so long is because it's safer, there's less restrictions, and there is just a, it's just a great atmosphere to be outside. However, at some point in time, we're going to have to be gathering inside. And again, we'll keep you updated on that. Uh, next week is Memorial Weekend, and we encourage you that if you're not going anywhere, uh, make sure you join us, whether it's uh, live, outdoors, or in your car or um, online, and so we, we just encourage you not to take a vacation day that weekend uh, from church. And if you do go away uh, on vacation, you have the great opportunity to still catch us online and to enjoy a service with your family or by yourself. Um, this morning, we're going to be continuing our series dealing with foundations and how important it is to have a strong foundation of faith. During this series, I will be focusing on what it means to be a follower of Christ. What does it look like when we call ourselves Christians? What does it look like when we proclaim Christ as our Lord and Savior? Well, in order to be a true follower, we have to have a strong foundation, a strong foundation on which we are standing in order for our faith to be truly effective in our lives. And I just want to encourage you that, um, that many of us struggle with the effectiveness of our faith. 
And I am doing my best to, uh, to help us as a, as a body, as a church, as, a, as individuals, as a, as a people group, as a tribe, to, to become more effective in how we live out our, our, our life, a life of faith. In our text last week, and we're going to be coming back to that text today, we made the statement that a disciple or a follower of Christ is characterized in three ways. He's characterized as a listener, as a leaner, and as a learner. And we focused on the, the, the first sentence of the text that says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock who hears as a listener, who puts as a leaner or engages within the conversation or, or, the, um, or the relationship and puts into practice. And the idea of practice is to be a, a learner. And we learn by practicing. We get better by practicing. You know, as a believer, I need to know that my foundation is a strong foundation. And this morning I want to tell you how important it is that you realize that your foundation matters. Your foundation matters. You know, when I first came to Christ at 17, back in 1977, I, I, I wanted to know what it meant to be a, a follower of Jesus. I wanted to know what it meant to be a Christian. And as a believer, I wanted to know what I was getting into. What does it mean to commit my life to Christ as a follower of him? When I think about this text that we, that we are going to be diving into again this morning, and I think about the idea of my foundation, I, I realize or I've learned that my foundation is the most important part of my walk in Christ. We're going to talk about that today. But I found out that my foundation is not a church. My foundation is not a building. My foundation is not a person in the church that I have a relationship with, whether it's the pastor, whether it's a spiritual father or a, a brother in Christ. But my foundation is in Christ whom our text this morning, God's word says, is our rock. Again, it says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 27, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And that's verse 24. Who built his house on what? The rock, the rock. I think of the story of the three little pigs and how the one pig built his house out of hay and then another little pig built his house out of sticks and the other little pig built his house out of bricks and how when the big bad wolf came and he huffed and he puffed and as he blew the house of hay, it collapsed. Little piggy went running off into the, into the house of sticks with the second little piggy. And as the big bad wolf came upon that house, he huffed and he puffed and he blew that house down. And the two little piggies fled that house as it collapsed to the house that the third little piggy built with bricks. And they escaped and found refuge in that house. And the big bad wolf huffed and he puffed and he blew, and he blew, and he huffed, and he puffed, and he could not blow that house down. Why? Because it was built out of bricks. It was built solid with a strong foundation. This morning we need to know that this rock that we believe in, this rock that Jesus says uh, whom he is, we need to believe that this rock is enough. What do, I, what do I mean by that? That this rock is enough, that this rock is big enough, 
This rock is strong enough, and this rock is capable enough of keeping us safe and stable and secure in the Lord during the storms of life. We'll just um, take a moment in a little bit, and we're going to read that whole uh, section of Scripture in Matthew 7, 24 through 27. But the, when you look at a foundation, and we had a series just a, a few months back where we talked about our lives as, as a house and, and how each of the rooms of the house signifies a certain place where Christ needs to dwell in our lives. And, and one of the first things that I focused on when I began that series was talking about the foundation and how important that foundation was. But the foundation of a house will tell you how big the house can get. You can't put a big house on a small or a faulty, frail, fragile uh, foundation. It will collapse at the, at the, uh, at the early, earliest signs of, of a storm. The same is true for our lives. You can't become what God wants you to be on a faulty foundation. We're given a lot of different options for what will be the foundation of our lives. You can build your life on the foundation of pop culture. In other words, some people think they'll simply do what everyone else is doing. That if it's popular, then that's what they're going to do. Yet what is popular today usually won't be popular tomorrow. Basing your life on pop culture is like building a house on a constantly moving foundation like sand. It doesn't work and it won't stand. What about tradition? Tradition is important to a lot of people and, and I think tradition is good. However, other people when they build their lives on what's always been done or how their parents did it, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to work. Tradition becomes tradition because it works for the moment, but no tradition lasts forever. It eventually wears out and it becomes obsolete. It's invalid. In Mark chapter 7, verse 8, Jesus tells the Pharisees never to put tradition before truth. That's a good reminder for all of us. Never put tradition before truth. A third way we can build this foundation, pop culture, tradition, is reason. God gave us the, the ability to reason, and we need to use it. But our reason isn't infallible. Proverbs 16, 25 says, There is a way that appears right to a man, but in the end it always leads to death. You see, the smartest of us will falter at times, but it's to be expected. Only God can be trusted all the time. And fourth, besides pop culture, tradition, and reason, another type of foundation we try to build on is emotion. Emotions drive us. Emotions motivate us. And in fact, in our current culture today, emotion dictates a lot of law and, and a lot of, um, of, of action by the people um, who are most emotional. Some build their lives on a feeling. If it feels right, they do it. But feelings can lie. They lie a lot. You lie to yourself more than anyone else. For if you live by your feelings, you'll spend your life manipulated by your feelings. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 says, We walk by faith and not by sight. And sight is what, uh, what motivates our feelings. How we feel and, and, and what we feel is usually based on what we see. If it doesn't work to build your life on pop culture, tradition, reason, or emotion, what should you build your life on? That's why we're looking today at something very, very important in this text, and that is God's Word. We're looking at the Word of God as being our foundation. Why specifically are we looking here? Because pop culture changes. Tradition grows stale. Reason can be faulty. 
and emotions can lie. Yet God's word, God's holy word, never changes. Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27, in its entirety, says this. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, that's what Jesus is saying, everyone who hears my teaching and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And Jesus is referring to himself as the rock, and we'll see why in just a minute. Verse 25 says, Well, the rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew, and it beat against that house. Yet it did not fall, because it had foundations where? On the rock. Then it goes on to say, But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man, a fool, who built his house on sand. Again, the rains came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. And what happened? It fell with a great crash. Why? Because the foundation was on sand and not on rock. Your foundation matters. You have to realize that. You have to understand that. Why it's important to have a strong foundation based on Jesus Christ. Not your job, not your marriage, not your friends, not uh, on your giftings, not on your talents, not on your bank account. It's on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I love the idea of, of the rock and the sand. And, and you realize what sand is. Sand is broken rock. Sand is, is crushed rock. Sand is the finely divided rock and mineral matter that gathers. But the rock is a, is, is a mass. It is, it is a solid, stable, steady mass. You know what? I love rocks. Three weeks ago, after our Mother's Day service, um, we got surprised, Rachel and I got surprised by our missionaries uh, that we've been supporting who serve in Guinea, West Africa, uh, happened to be home on furlough or medical leave, and uh, Tom and Sherry Moore showed up at the end of our service, and, and we had a chance to visit. We took them to lunch and uh, spent about three hours or so after lunch just talking, just catching up, laughing, and, and just enjoying one another. And as they got ready to leave, and, and uh, we were able to send some things with them uh, on their journey, I looked in the back of Tom's car, and I see these, these two rocks. And as I picked them up, and I looked, them, I looked at them, and on the outside, it looks like just a regular rock. But when I turned them over, I don't know if you can see, these in, see this in the camera, but um, the, the rock itself is just absolutely gorgeous. Uh, somebody opened it up and then, then kind of finished it off on the inside, and it's just absolutely gorgeous. And, and I told Tom, those are beautiful. And he just handed them to me, and he said, you can have them. And I thought, man, that is just uh, gorgeous. And, and I, I, it, it makes me remember, as a kid, um, some of the things that we used to do when we lived in New Jersey, um, our house butted up against a, uh, uh, thousands of acres of, of wooded land that was fenced off. And it was owned by a chemical plant. And uh, throughout all of these woods were um, fire roads that the uh, chemical security would drive to make sure that nobody was uh, messing around in the woods. Well, guess what we did? We found a hole in the fence, and, and all of the kids of the neighborhood would go play out in those woods. And uh, we'd build tree houses and forts and all that kind of stuff. And one of the things we would do is we would have rock wars. Yeah, yeah, rock wars. So we would get all the neighborhood kids together, and we would divide up into two teams. And usually on one team were myself and all my bro older brothers and, and uh, other kids from the neighborhood, and on the other team you know, various kids from the neighborhood, and we would throw rocks at each other. Yep, that's what we would do. And uh, it's kind of like paintball. It was kind of like the, uh, the, the uh, modern day version of paintball. And, uh, you know, if you get tagged with the rock, you're, you're out. And there were no protective gear. We didn't wear helmets. We didn't wear goggles or anything like that. If you got hit, you got hit. 
And um, uh, my brothers taught me how to use a slingshot. And not, not the one that you hold and pull back with the wooden Y. It, it, it was the one with the two strings and the, and the, the leather pouch at the, at, at, in the middle of it. You throw a rock in there and then you, you sling it and you let it go. Well, I got to the point where, where I, I had a pretty good arm and a pretty accurate throw, and I could hit you know, most anything I was, I was aiming at. But with that slingshot, I, I was able to throw farther, and I was able to usually hit around, if not the target, that I was aiming at. And so it, it, it became quite fun, and, and uh, I, I, I never really got hit very much, except one day I did get hit right in the middle of the forehead, and I have a little scar on my forehead that reminds me of the fun that we used to have playing rock wars in the, uh, the woods of the chemical plant. Now, I know some of you are probably thinking, you know, Pastor, that's it. That's exactly what's wrong with you. You've been tagged one too many times in the head with a rock. And I know my wife or my kids uh, might have a tendency to uh, agree with you. But another thing, my, my brother, one of my brothers, uh, just became enamored with rocks. And he just loved to collect rocks. And not, not to go somewhere where somebody already found them and then buy them and put them as part of his collection. He wanted to go out and actually find them himself. And he amassed a, a pretty decent-sized rock collection. And, and he'd also go out and look for Indian arrowheads along the riverbanks of the area back in Iowa where we lived, and he found quite a few of those and, and uh, just really loved to do that. And so he, his collection became fairly large uh, before he passed away, but it was uh, something that he loved to do and something he became known for among his friends. And some of his friends would find a rock and, and, and bring it, and he'd add it to his collection. You know, um, when we first came here to uh, San Jose and we were thinking about uh, jump starting and thinking of different ways that might help the church um, just renew its uh, impact in the community. And one of the things we had talked about, investigated, and, and never really moved forward on, and I'll tell you why in a moment, but was changing the name of the church. And we thought about changing the name of the church to The Rock. And so I was on a mission to find this huge boulder. And all I could think about was the, um, the old insurance company that, uh, that had the, the, the Plymouth Rock as its emblem. And I'm thinking, man, I want a rock like that. And we're going to put it out in front of the church and, and, uh, and just have this big old huge rock sitting out there with uh, a sign that says The Rock. And, you know, we answered the phone, San Jose Open Bible Church, Open Bible Church. And, and instead of that, we were going to answer the phone, The Rock. You know, and I thought that was so cool, but we didn't find a big rock. We didn't change our name. So we are still Open Bible Church, San Jose. In the Old Testament, there is a, um, there's, there's a, a constant reference to rocks and, and how significant they are in the uh, identity of God and who God was. They, they defined him as a rock, being a rock, a fortress, and a firm place to stand. In Psalm 18, 31, the psalmist wrote, For who is God besides the Lord? And who is the rock except our God? The rock. And in Matthew chapter 16, verses 16 through 18, Jesus asked the, the, the question to his disciples, Who do people say I am? And they threw some answers at him, and, and then he said, But who do, you, who do you say I am? And Simon Peter said, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. You are the Christ. Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock, not Peter, Petra, but on him, Jesus, on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades or hell will not overcome it. So Jesus, again, was referring to himself as the rock 
for the church. Just like God is the rock and, and identified himself as such in the Old Testament. And then in Psalm 62, 6, it says, Truly he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress and I will not be shaken. He is my fortress. And the idea of that is a, is a rock structure that is protecting the inhabitants inside from any assault from the outside. And they are safe in the midst of that fortress. And then in Psalm 40, verse 2, He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire, and He set my feet on a rock, and He gave me, what? A firm place to stand. And I think about a rock being a, a, a place of stability. If you ever tried to run or, or walk in mud or in, a, in an area that was just absolutely uh, loose traction, and the idea of that is your footing. And so in order to stabilize your footing, God lifts us out of those situations and he places us on a rock. And who is the rock again? It's God. It's his son, Jesus Christ, a firm place to stand. So I want to encourage you to, today to remember that the rock is enough. It is big enough, it is strong enough, and it is capable enough of keeping us stable and secure in the Lord during our storm of life. You see, your foundation matters. Paul in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13 says, Therefore put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to do what? Stand your ground. Solid ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. And that idea is having firm footing. And the way you have firm footing is by standing on the rock. It says in Isaiah chapter 7, uh, verse 9, this last part of that verse, it says, If you do not stand firm in your faith you will not stand at all. Man, that's powerful. If you do not stand firm in your faith, if you don't have a strong foundation, if you don't have a foundation that is big enough to stabilize you and to secure you, you will not stand at all. So Paul said in regard to this rock in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Verses 10 through 11, he said, by the grace God has given me, he says, I, Paul, laid a foundation. He's talking about the foundation that he's laying as a wise builder. And someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. So Paul is saying, I'm laying on the foundation of Jesus Christ a structure in you, in your life. And he said, I started it, but somebody else is coming to finish it. He said, there's other people going to be building on it, so be careful who you allow to build on it. But make sure that what they're building on is a firm foundation. And that foundation, he says, is Jesus Christ. You see, this rock, Jesus, he's big enough, he's strong enough, and he's capable enough of keeping us stable and safe and secure in the Lord during any assault, during any storm of life. You see, we have to make sure that Jesus doesn't become part of our rock collection. He just doesn't become a rock among many rocks that we've collected. But we want to make sure that he is the rock in our collection, so to speak. That he is the rock upon which we are building our foundation on. Somebody once said that sometimes God lets you hit rock bottom only so you can realize that he is the rock at the bottom. He is the rock at the bottom. Paul also compared Jesus to the rock in the desert during the 40 years of wandering by Israel before they were to enter the promised land. I found that quite interesting. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the first four verses, Paul said, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant or unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. In other words, all of the fathers were, were part of the, the, the same group that were being led through the wilderness. 
All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food. All drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. So what rock is he talking about? He's talking about the Old Testament reference of the rock found in Exodus 17 and in Numbers chapter 20. In Exodus 17, it's, it's the rock that, uh, that was at the beginning of their wanderings, and the people were upset because they had no water. And they were crying out to Moses saying, you've led us this far in the desert for us to die of thirst. Give us water. And so God told Moses, go to this rock and strike it with the staff that we use to part the Red Sea. So Moses took the staff, went to the rock, struck it, and water flowed from that rock, and it, it gave people life. It, it, it restored their energy. It restored their, their life by, the, uh, by having water to drink. And then in chapter 20 of Numbers, same thing was happening. And this is at the end of their journey, before they were to be led into the promised land. And God said to Moses um, to speak to the rock. And it was at that time that Moses struck the rock twice, like he did the first time, but his instruction was to speak to the rock, and water would flow. Well, he struck it twice, water did flow, but he lost the opportunity because of his disobedience and rebellion against God to enter into the promised land. That's why Joshua was given the mantle of leadership to lead the people into the promised land. So among Jewish scholars, it is believed that this rock that is referred to in, in Exodus 17 and in Numbers 20 is the exact same rock. And what they mean by it wasn't that a rock that was in the same location. It is truly believed that the people of Israel brought the rock with them on the journey. And all along the journey, this rock would provide water for them to drink in the desert during their wanderings. You see, there's a certain, what they call an ancient logic that's at work here. After all, the Israelites had manna given to them miraculously every morning, along with a nice helping of quail meat. But what about water? Are we to think that the corresponding miraculous supply of water was only given twice, 40 years apart? Of course not. So to solve this problem, the water supply became mobile, almost like a portable drinking fountain. Can you imagine that? They had water at every chance they had, every stop, every, every junction along the way, they had water that came from this rock. Well, why is that? Because it's referred to in the first, uh, in, in first Corinthians chapter 10 as the rock that was uh, that accompanied, accompanied them in some versions or followed them in the NIV. And the rock was representative of what? Paul said that rock is representative of Christ. You see, this rock is big enough, strong enough, capable enough of keeping us stable, safe, and secure in the Lord during any assault and any storm of life. It's also the cornerstone. Well, what's a cornerstone? Isaiah 28, verse 16 says, Therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. Look, I am placing a foundation stone in Jerusalem, a firm and tested stone. It is a precious cornerstone that is safe to build on. Whoever believes need never be shaken. The cornerstone was one of the most important stones of the foundation because it's what all the other stones followed or, or were laid in suit because of the, uh, the, the cornerstone, which was larger, bigger, small, uh, stronger, and uh, more, had more stability for the foundation that all the other stones were to be uh, set off of. Matthew chapter 24, verses 42 to 44, Jesus said, Have you never read in the scriptures the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? He's talking about himself. He said, the Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Verse 43, therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people. What people? You and me. 
Gentiles who are becoming disciples and followers of Christ, he goes on to say, who will produce fruit. And verse 44, anyone who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces, and anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. What does that mean? It means that when we come to the stone, the foundation of our lives, and we throw ourselves on it in humility, we will be broken. And, and broken in a sense of, of, of broken for service and, and, and broken to serve God. Whereas if we reject the stone, the stone will fall on us and will crush us. Our lives will be destroyed. God said, when you build your house, build it on the rock, the cornerstone, the one in whom you can throw yourself on and be broken, but yet you will also thrive in the um, in the relationship that he's trying to establish with us. As I close this morning, you may not always understand his word. You may not always like it. It won't always be politically correct. It won't always be easy to understand. But it is the only thing stable enough to build our lives on. Jesus said, when you put my word into practice, it is like building your house on a rock. And when we put his word into practice, we are laying a foundation, a stable foundation, and we will find out that this rock is enough. This rock is is enough. He's big enough, he's strong enough, and he's capable enough to keep us stable and safe and secure in the Lord during the storms of life. Next week when we gather together, we're going to be talking about um, when, when we trust our faith, and uh, excuse me, when, he, when we trust in God and put our faith in him and the storms come, what does God do to sustain us as, as the rock in our lives how does he sustain us? Don't miss it. I'll see you next week. Take a minute right now that if you have a prayer request, would you just text to the number on your screen, 408-547-4911, the word prayer. And if you have a request that you would like for us to pray for and join you uh, in praying for, please text uh, a little bit of a detail around your, your uh, word prayer. And we would love to pray with you and for you during this time. Take a minute now and just enjoy the worship team and, and just allow your heart to think about what it means to have the rock in your life, a rock that's big enough, strong enough, stable enough for your life. I love you. appreciate you. God bless you. Have a good week in Him. This is my offering In every moment I withhold nothing I'm learning to trust you Even when I can't see it And even in suffering I have to believe it If you say it's wrong Then I'll say no if you say release, I'm letting go. If you're in it with me, I'll begin. When you say to jump, I'm diving in. If you say be still, then I will wait. If you say to trust, I will obey. I don't want to follow my own way. I'm done chasing feelings, spirit lead. like a burden but once I could grasp it you took me further further than I was asking and simply to see you it's worth it all my life is an altar it's your fire fall if you say
say it's wrong, then I'll say no. If you say release, I'm letting go. If you're in it with me, I'll begin. When you say to jump, I'm diving in. If you say be still, then I will wait. If you say to trust, I will obey. Teach me how to follow in your way. I'm done chasing feelings. Chasing feelings 